Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Sumal Pereira, the chairman of Satosa Motors, is our guest on Spotlight today as we explore a range of issues pertaining to Sri Lanka's motor industry. Then, Sharang Pant, the managing director of Nielsen, assesses the downward spiral of the LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index. And finally, we talk to LMD's columnist Sharan Fernando for his perspectives on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Welcome to yet another edition of Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Today we discuss or we continue to focus on, the, on Sri Lanka's motor industry. And ahead on the program, we intend to discuss key issues such as the relevance of global trends on the Sri Lankan market, Sri Lanka's efforts to adopt a more eco-friendly uh, uh, vehicle policy, also the strategies adopted to complete, compete with the grey imports market and the government's carbon and luxury taxes. Joining us today is Sumal Pereira, the chairman of Satosa Motors, and he will give us an insight on the motor industry and Sri Lanka's efforts at moving forward. So, Sumal, thank you very much for joining us today on Benchmark. So, when you look at the motor industry right now, what do you see? Well, the motor industry is a very sensitive industry when it comes to our national economy because uh, our national economy, one of the key economic goals is managing our balance of payment. And the motor industry is always used by policymakers, government, to always try and interfere when, when we have balance of payment problems, like what happened the last six months to one year. Furthermore, we are a country without a iota of energy. That means we don't have any energy locally. So uh, we are very vulnerable when it comes to as a nation for our imports when the oil prices go up. You know, so and out of the oil, other than the power stations, the rest of the oil mostly is for public and private transport. So, you cannot talk of the motor vehicle industry in isolation without understanding the background ramification it has to our national economy. So, at the same time, last budget, for example, I was very happy when the finance minister spoke about electrification because that is one way of getting out of this vulnerable situation. But no follow-up in this budget. So, so there is no continuity in that policy. I would like to urge governments, present and future, to be totally committed to that cause because it creates and enables us to kill more than one bird with one stone that is one is our environment secondly our dep dependence on oil imports which creates hav havoc whenever the oil prices go up you know last four or five years we are relatively lucky that the oil prices were low but I think that honeymoon is over. Now you will see an increase in oil prices with uh, with all the restrictions placed on Iran and so on and so forth. So I think the motor industry is an important industry for the economy from two points of view because we are spending so billions of rupees on our road network. So we cannot any way restrict our mode in this, then that is defeating its another purpose, you know. You know. Now, there are grey importers in the market. What are the strategies that 
uh, the industry have actually, industry players have actually adopted to uh, compete with the grey importers? The grey imports are uh, uh, natural f f thing when you have a free market economy, you know. So each each franchise o owner has to have its own policy. The government can't interfere there because grey importers are also should be allowed to trade and it is up to the consumer to differentiate between the benefits from the grey imports or, or a franchise. But government has done a lot to make it an equal playing field by having duties at the same level for the grey market and the franchise. So that is good because now earlier there was accusations, accusations that the grey market was resorting to big time under invoicing. So that is now out of the equation because now it is on engine capacity that the duty is uh, charged. So like you mentioned, um, the inconsistency in government policy when it comes to introducing uh, and uh, developing the eco-friendly and electric market uh, is, is very apparent right now. What do you think the industry should be doing and how do you think the government actually should be implementing the policies it, it articulates? I believe whatever politics or the country situation is, our country needs both government and opposition parties to come together at least on major economic framework, you know, because we are, I think both parties are, op have now embraced the open economic policies, so, and not play politics with the economy, you know. If, if that doesn't happen, whatever we say will be of no use because one government will use the for policy framework or the, the giving subsidies or giving benefits for political purposes. Then the other party will try to outdo them. So in that what ha finally happens is the economy gets totally affected and uh, they don't see it the next day but they see it in the short term and the long term. When so, but if, for example, on motor vehicles or, or on energy, on the power mix for the country, you know, if they have a all-party conference and get the experts also involved and have this is our energy policy for the next 20 years, and everybody signs off and get it approved by parliament. Same for the motor vehicles, you know, everybody agree and get it passed by parliament. And food security, you know, like that, if they take about five major hits, or even for that matter, non-economic factors like devolution, all that, then only this country can go forward, you know. At the moment, we are going backward, we are going down, and... Unfortunately, the business community is looking elsewhere. So we stop for a short break, Suma, and coming up after that, we will continue this discussion on the motor industry. Coming up after the break, Suma Pereira talks about how the motor industry can uh, improve its resilience in an uncertain policy landscape and also whether the government's public transport initiatives uh, will impact consumer behavior. Stay with us. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal. LMD podcast now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. You're crazy. Crazy for money. Oh. 
10,000 steps done. Who oh, the man? I do it every single day. Show me the money. So you run 10,000 steps every day, huh? You must be fit. <laughs> Some days I do 20,000. <laughs> So thank you for staying with Benchmark. We now resume our discussion with Sumal Pereira, the chairman of Satosa Motors. Now, your industry is one that faces numerous changes in duties and taxations. I mean, from the ear dot, whenever the government feels, uh, when budgets come across, when consecutive governments, governments come in. So in your view, what measures can the industry take actually to improve your resilience in this uh, instable environment that you function in? I am a firm, firm believer that the moat industry should be used as a revenue earner for the country because it is a most of the time a total import based business. So we have to use that as a major revenue earner. But it, you cannot leave uh, sort of loopholes or gaps like allowing some personal license without any value addition to assemble vehicles here, you know, which is leads a unfair or a in unequal playing field, you know. I believe that without taxing the food industry and all, motor vehicle, because I'm a I must tell you, in my opinion, I believe that our country has to depend on indirect taxes. Because what we read in the budget or in the publications is only half the economy. There is another half of the economy which is not in the official statistics or for that matter in the official tax net. So how, how do we counter that? only way we counter that is by indirect taxes. You tax them when you consume. And furthermore, I believe that the motor vehicle and the fuel or oil where you US is a very easy way of ensuring no leakages in your tax collection because Oil imports are one party at one, one point, and that is also by a state organization. So, without taxing about 5,000 and 10,000 items and uh, making this country a place which has no uh, confidence for people that they are getting a fair deal you might as well take about five items. One, and motor vehicle and the fuel is definitely one on the short term till we convert to a fully electric environment. And it's fair because I think a person who owns a car and who runs a vehicle is more than a lower middle class person, you know. So they can afford to pay Whereas, what is happening now, they are killing entrepreneurship by using a very high and not viable taxes on businesses and entrepreneurship. You tax, tax the entrepreneur, what does it mean? You are driving him away from entrepreneurship. You are making him unviable environment for his entrepreneurship. Today everybody pays lip service and says this country to to improve must foster and improve on entrepreneurship. What are they doing about it? They are doing nothing about it. You know, I'm not talking of the top 500 businessmen. I'm talking of the smallest entrepreneur itself. You know, so the interest rates are high. Taxes are high, 
you know sir supply chain services are high and they no entrepreneur knows the priorities of the government what is the policy of the government which will give them a incentive to make sustained investments for example i'll give you an example one time they gave a lot of incentive to de- develop the real estate sector you know two years later they bring in vat then i'm not saying not to bring vat that's not my point what i'm trying to say is what you do two years ago two years later cannot be made a u turn because the ministers change or something now the government wants to modernize the public transportation system uh, budget 2019 was quite clear on that uh, how do you think that is going to impact the industry and consumer behavior public transport should be improved especially on the suburban and the short intercity range but suburban the global public transport has gone way ahead of us in the last 20 30 years for example uh, i was in china and uh, one chinese gentleman asked me now this new trains you are getting to for the up country line uh, how far is i said kalambu can be 72 miles 72 miles it takes about two and a half to three hours he said 72 miles to Two and a half to three hours. He said, "Tomorrow morning I'm going from Beijing to Tianjin. It's thirty-one minutes. Thirty-one minutes. You know, it's more than uh, it's close to hundred miles. You know, so so unless we do, we have to. But of course, we are not very rich country, so we have to identify our priorities. What are we going to use? Are we going to use rail, or are we going to use buses?" Now all the buses what we see here are on lorry chassis, not on bus chassis. You know the most of the public transport buses are on lorry chassis. You know so you know it creates a lot of bottlenecks. For example, a simple bottleneck is the entrance to the bus. You know, <laughs> you know in other countries it's all low flow. The whole width of the bus is like entrances, like or. Oh, like uh, when you get into a train or so the all a big entrances not making it a bottleneck so here we have one small entrance people have to get in get out and then it has to be completely revamped you know and i think um, in the future we should concentrate on more very practical and short term benefit economic targets than these big mega projects which take a long time to have the economic benefit of example if we can get from china india and japan or whatever complete fleet of buses at concessionary rates and that will have a huge immediate impact on our economy What is your take on locally manufactured uh, cars the industry per se do you think that is viable I personally think it's not viable because here is a it is a based on volume you know it's based on any business that is based on volume our country it is not viable you know and of course you can do a assembly plant or some sort of assembly but the benefit of that if you work it out because that is one area of revenue government gets by taxing the motor vehicle industry that that is also been deprived you know so as a final question sumal what prospects do you see to in the rest of 2019 for the motor industry well in the present policy environment it's a good industry to be in because it will always have its ups and downs but if you have your fundamentals strong and you have good partners and good franchises all the good will always outweigh the bad and you have a one or two good years that will be good enough to see you through the 
bad years. But uh, I yet think unless there is a policy consistency and a national policy based not only on the motor vehicle industry, may more on the more important economic things like the oil, fuel imports, the balance of payment, the currency, stability. The motor vehicle industry has a bigger role to play in that picture. Thank you so much, Sumar, for that very no holds barred conversation on the motor industry. Thanks so much for joining us. And so that was a conversation we had with Sumar Pereira, the chairman of Satasa Motors, on the motor industry in Sri Lanka. On the other side, we have Anushan Selvaraja with more. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcasts, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Go! Ooh, rah. What on earth are you doing? I'm making money! You're crazy! Crazy for money! <laughs> 10,000 steps done! Who oh, the man! I do it every single day! Show me the money. So, you run 10,000 steps every day, huh? You must be fit. <laughs> Some days I do 20,000. Welcome back to the show, I'm Anushan Selvaraja. Now for a close look at the latest on the LMB Nielsen Business Confidence Index. Joining me is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharang Pant. Welcome back to the show, Sharang. Now we've gone through a bit of a turbulent time, uh, but just tell us how the BCI has performed. We've seen that it's dropped quite a bit. So uh, the sentiments are down. I think this, uh, the index has come down to 77, which is the lowest number in the last eight years. Various reasons to it, we feel there is a bit of worry coming in into the business uh, fraternity right now. The budget was announced, a uh, few good things, few not so good things, so not sure which way uh, the economy will move and therefore the business leaders were worried about the overall economy and their business prospects which reflects in the index as well. It came down from the previous month to this month at 77. If you look at other reasons, what could possibly bring this down? There are a few factors which are still in the positive in terms of the exports still doing well. In terms of the currency, the, uh, the rupee has appreciated marginally compared to the US dollar. But the uh, Q4 2018 GDP numbers were released early April or late March and the number came down to 1.8. So the GDP growth for a quarter was below 2% for the first time since 2014 or in the last five years. So it's leading to uh, anxiety as to where the economy will be heading, though there are other factors which are still positive. On the consumer front as well, things haven't really picked up as yet. Sentiments have also come down. The index has come down to 46. Uh, the consumer isn't losing his or her purse as yet. So all these factors together is what is pulling down the business sentiment right now. Where do they see the economy uh, going in the short and the long term? So previous month we saw about 20% of the leaders saying the economy will improve in the next 12 months. This month that number has come down to 9% and almost two thirds of the leaders feel the economy might go down further. We think it's, it's more to do with the Q4 numbers that were released recently and which was one of the lowest number as I mentioned earlier. So economic prospects are on the lower side. When it comes to business prospects, about one in three felt that in the long term the business might improve but about 18%, 18 to 20% are feeling that the numbers or the, the uh, business uh, prospects will be positive in the short term or the long term. Based on what happened recently, Sharang, how do you see the BCI performing going forward? 
uh, we, we expect the number to go down further. We expect the investment to come down significantly because there will be a worry around the security aspects in the country. The biggest blow will obviously be on tourism and we've already started seeing that the hotels are empty, the airport isn't busy enough. Uh, that will br definitely bring down the demand for Sri Lanka as a market, be it a tourist market or an investment market and which will clearly be reflected on the sentiments, both consumer as well as uh, business leader sentiments. Thank you very much for joining us, Sharang. Thank you. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharang Pant. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the economy, joining me is economist and LMD columnist Shiran Fernando. Welcome back to the show, Shiran. Now, we've gone through a bad period in our country's uh, history. Now, how has the, the, the Easter attacks, how has it impacted our economy? Um, so, I think it's been a really tough week uh, for, the con for the country as a whole, as, as, as a nation. Uh, and I offer my condolences to all those that are impacted by this uh, uh, terror attack. Uh, I think it will take weeks and months uh, for us to heal as, as, uh, and years probably as a nation. Uh, but we have to slowly, um, you know, move back to some degree of normalcy and also uh, see what the economic uh, impacts are. Uh, so I think the immediate thing, especially when you look at uh, a terror attack and especially for a tourist destination, uh, tourist destination is impact for the hospitality industry, uh, what it means in terms of the arrivals and things like that. Um, so right now a lot of figures being quoted around uh, in terms of maybe uh, 1 billion uh, loss or a 1.5 billion loss. Um, historically, I mean, if you look at uh, some of the data that uh, the World Travel and Tourism Council has put out, um, on average it takes about 13 months for a country to sort of recover, and that is uh, that is just based on uh, I think I think the last 15 to 17 years. Uh, but what uh, really and, and what they sort of emphasize a lot is it really depends on how uh, the response is, both in terms of security, how much you sort of um, you know, provide that confidence that this is just a one-off. There won't be repeated attacks of this nature. And in terms of the PR side of it, how you communicate this uh, in terms of Sri Lanka being a safe destination. Um, so countries have recovered from it. The first 12 months are definitely difficult. Um, the other side of it beyond tourism is the trickle-down impacts from it. Uh, there are a lot of supply chains that are connected to tourism. Uh, Sri Lanka's growth number, as I've been discussing over several months, has been on the downtrend and uh, this will definitely be a drag on growth. Um, as the governor has emphasized repeatedly, it's very early to quantify it because um, April is also uh, it's a very slow month in terms of uh, activity with the out of the season just before that. Uh, so come May, come June, I think that will really show us how uh, economic activity has been affected. But definitely I think the SMEs and especially some of the startups are very much uh, what really depended on the domestic economy are impacted by it. Um, so the process of how resilient now the economy will be will uh, come into fruition in May and June and, and, the, and the rest of the months this year. So then what do we need to do now, Shiran, to get back up to the level we were at? So I think uh, the main focus should right now be in terms of security uh, because that's uh, first and foremost, both for the public, both for employees, uh, both, I mean, in terms of just getting back to a normal sense of security. Uh, that's the one thing. The other is in terms of, I think the government is talking about these, um, you know, to, to revive some of these sectors that are impacted, committees to, to look into that. Now those need to show results and it just not should not be just committees that are appointed, but something maybe uh, that will actually have an impact, take the stakeholders' views in properly and implement it. Uh, and I think uh, given all that, uh, we also have to be mindful coming in. The macro fundamentals have been much sounder compared to, say, um, October last year. Uh, so in that 
in that a bit of a stable footing, we can sort of have a bit of a base to now uh, move forward on. Uh, but the debt dynamics are still uh, not in our favor. We still need to continue uh, managing that as well. And the global environment right now is favorable uh, in terms of the financial markets. But uh, I mean, we get those people whether, yeah, whether whether that'll you know continue for the rest of the year is, is the case. So some of those factors are right now favorable for us to you know maybe take us sit back and then uh, strategize forward. Uh, but we can't be complacent in this time. Now the business sector kind of got together and came up with an action plan to submit it to the government. What are your thoughts on this plan? Um, so it's good. I mean, it, these kind of moments uh, unite a lot of uh, people and I think the action point is, is it was quite uh, direct in terms of the five areas that they were looking at. Uh, now it really depends if it's now taken on board or at least parts of it is implemented. Uh, and not just thought of it in the near term and I think maybe plans like this need to be monitored uh, by, by, by the parties that sent it across to see whether uh, these are being implemented if it's not highlighted and see that there's some kind of a follow-up process because security I think um, is the key part here and that's the key part of this recovery. Thank you very much for joining us Shiran. Thank you Anne, for having me. That was Economist and LMD columnist Shiran Fernando. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.